colonization, the um, takeover of um, the Western world, the takeover of the Aborigines, the takeover of um, uh, different parts of the world. Now, contrary to that, Islam has never made the claim uh, in terms of its impositional nature. It doesn't believe it's not imperialistic by nature. Despite the behavior of certain governments, and you look at the governments of Saudi Arabia, you look at the governments of Afghanistan, you look at various other governments which are oppressive in nature. More often than not, these governments appropriate religion as a purpose or basis for political expedience. But nowhere can you find any kind of basis for that in the authentic source of Islam, the Quran. Although, of course, you have these people who justify the actions based upon so-called Islamic teachings. But when you look at it deeper, you find that it is an atomistic approach, an atomistic approach to religion, an atomistic approach to scripture, where you look at a particular verse, you take it out of context, and then of course you make it serve whatever end you wish to serve. As I said earlier on, um, Islam itself is, it cannot be categorized as a religion in the conventional sense of the word. It's not religion in the conventional sense. It goes beyond that. We've got five more minutes, so I'm going to hand over to Dr. Who will give a rebuttal or something. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. I didn't come prepared for that. That's why I'm laughing. Okay. Um, th th then, of course, you know, there are other instances um, which we find, for example, in respect of the nature of Christ, the nature of Jesus in Islam, which is singularly different from that of Christianity. Uh, but more often than not, if you look deeper into the workings of the Old and the New Testament, you find the essential message there. And I'll give you an example. For example, in Job chapter 25, verse 10, you read the expression, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon and it shineth not, ye the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a maggot, and the son of man, which is a worm. Son of man obviously referring to a prophet of God, and we obviously refer to Jesus in that context. Any prophet of God on a higher specific level. One time, I believe it was Peter who came to Jesus and questioned him. He said, when will the last day be? In other words, when will the coming of the hour be? And Jesus responds and says unto him, he says, the angels don't know. The Son doesn't know. The only one who knows is my Father in heaven. So that begs the question, if all three are one, how could the Father know and the Son not know about the coming of the last hour? In Luke, um, John chapter 5 verse 30, Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear a judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that had sent me. So the point is, even within the Gospel accounts, there is much in terms of which if Christians go back to their accounts, and based on the kind of um, uh, distinction that I've given you, which even the Anglican Church laid down the three criteria for being a Christian, accepting the historical personage of Jesus Christ as a kind of a, a moral exemplification of, 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 of deity, of divinity. I have no problem with that. So if mainstream Christians have to accept that specific view, then in particular, um, there will be this mutual distrust which falls away as far as salvation is concerned. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In other words, whatever righteous action you do, you will be held accountable. Whatever wicked action you do, you will be held accountable. But if the wicked will turn from that uh, which is unjust and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And that is Islam in a sense. You pay for your sins, I pay for my sins, in a sense, in terms of the whole doctrine of salvation. I do understand times at a limitation, but I'd like to end it on this particular point. Um, from the Christian point of view, uh, of course, maybe I might amplify this in this discussion, that there is, in a sense, the kind of contemporary manifestations of Islam leave a lot to be desired. You look at Muslim governments, you look at the contemporary application of uh, the Sharia, or in fact the distortion of the Sharia in its original sense. The fact that a great degree of emphasis has been placed on juristic interpretation of classical jurists as opposed to the Quran and the prophetic paradigm of the Sunnah itself. Sorry, but, sir, we're running out of time. Okay, I understand that. I'll just end up with a specific quotation. It said believers, both Christians and Muslims, 
are indeed on the verge of extinction. Both Islam and Christianity will survive in their scriptures, even perhaps as individual creeds of personal salvation. But not as worldviews with contemporary messages that lead and shape the world, that honor will belong to a bogus mystique of culture based on the materialistic perversion of the ideal of liberty. And that will happen if we allow secularism to take over contemporary society, to reshape society with us. Both Muslims and Christians, secular society has no problem with your churches. It has no problem with our mosques. It has no problems with our religious services and obligations. It has no problems with us emphasizing the formalist aspects of faith. But it does have a problem when we as believers or as communities decide to practice the essence of the faith the essence of the teachings of Jesus and Muhammad in shaping and creating a relevant contemporary society that can change the world and reshape the entire fabric of communities throughout different parts of the world. I thank you for this opportunity in this short particular period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf Ishmael for that good discussion and opening comments. We're going to hand over to Dr. Sekim and then um, others can make comments as they feel that they want to participate. Um, we, uh, I really had in my mind that we were going to sit and have a, a discussion around uh, as a, not more as a formal paper, but more just as just talking to each other as two people of faith, Muslims and Christians. So Dr. Sekim, if you'd like to respond, and then anyone else after that would like to make a comment or two um, from the Christian perspective, then we can do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, as I laughed before, <laughs> I wasn't quite prepared for this uh, because I didn't know what what um, we were going to be doing, except that we were going to be discussing um, what Muslims distrust, why, what was it, why Muslims distrust Christians, why Christians distrust Muslims, and how we can move beyond that. And um, I enjoyed your words very much. Thank you. Um, and I could have listened to you easily for another half an hour. <laughs> very learned man and uh, learned in things Christian uh, as well as uh, in, other, in, in other things so uh, it was very interesting hearing a lot of things that I'm familiar with <coughs> coming from a, another angle I do thank you for that I, I, I think um, you know where you are ending up um, there certainly is a point of convergence as I uh, I'm thinking as I go along, so you'll have to bear with me with a bit of, but there'll probably be a bit of rubbish comes out of here as well. <laughs> but um, you appear to see secularism as a kind of uh, great uh, enemy, and I think I would share that, um, that point of view. Um, But um, going from there to the beginning of your address uh, and your comments about Jesus and Christian belief that Jesus is uh, God become a human being um, and uh, you're saying that many modern um, church people are having second thoughts about that themselves. <coughs> What, what you're looking at there, I think, is a, a secular reinterpretation of Christianity. Uh, what happened at the time of the Enlightenment in Europe was that there was a, a huge intellectual rebellion against the church, against its authority, against the authority of Christian belief. And, uh, and with that, I mean, fundamental to the Enlightenment worldview, the Enlightenment um, project, which really has led to secularism, was a, a rejection of miracle. Miracle cannot happen. That's, that's, that's one of their fundamental axioms. And if there's no such thing as miracle, then by definition, uh, what, what does that mean? What that means is, uh, of course this was a whole Enlightenment project uh, was built upon the um, some of the successes of, of, of science, of modern science as it was then, and, and the kind of worldview which came with it that the 
that the world is a closed system, that God doesn't interfere, uh, that everything works according to natural law. And if there's no miracle, if God doesn't intervene, um, then of course Jesus cannot be God. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, it's axiomatic to that whole way of thinking. And, and as that, as that worldview gathered momentum, you've got more and more and more people in the church um, trying to basically write that out of Christianity. Now you're talking to people here for whom that kind of Christianity, the people you mentioned, the Tubingham School, um, who else did you mention? Wellhausen. I have to say to you <laughs> that these men are our enemies. <laughs> we regard these people as having dragged Christianity uh, down a false uh, road. You know, in the last... Oh, what are we talking about in the uh, Enlightenment? I suppose we're talking about the 17th century, 18th century. Let's say the best part of 200, 250 years. Uh, secular, uh, rationalistically minded, anti-God people in the church <coughs> have been trying to drag Christianity into that kind of worldview and uh, in relation to the Bible for example in the last 200 years there is not a single uh, sentence in the Bible that some scholar has not tried to falsify now <coughs> you can say that's Christianity but for us who are Christians that's anti-Christianity and we've been battling with that or I've been ever since I became a Christian at the age of 18, I was studying science in university in Australia at that time uh, when, uh, when Christ came in on my life and I surrendered my life to him. Um, uh, you know, I've been battling against that. I would have to say that, uh, that where we stand at the present day is that, I, I shouldn't exaggerate, but... <laughs> I would say again and again and again where Christians have, have met the challenge of that kind of anti-supernatural, anti-God um, anti uh, scholarship, um, the Bible has emerged, um, has emerged uh, truth so that in teaching Christianity, teaching the Bible to students today, I find myself in a much, much easier position than my forefathers, uh, say, even 50 years ago did. Um, now, I think the next thing I'd want to say is that, uh, that scholars, uh, we don't reject them per se, we listen to what they have to say, but we don't uh, believe what they say, unless we see what they're saying is in agreement with the Bible. We have a canon, what we call a canon, scripture. Canon simply means a yardstick. It's, a, it's, a, it's, the, it's the standard. It's the standard against which we judge what is true Christianity and what is false Christianity. So if we're reading Augustine, for example, and we find him out of line with the Bible, then he's out of line. He's, what he's saying is not Christian. Much of what he said was Christian. Some of what he said was not Christian. Um, you, you took us to the Gospel of John, and uh, and uh, let me let me take us there. Uh, although I could take us to many other places. Um, chapter one. In Archae in Hologos, in the beginning was the Word. Kaiologos uh, in cross tontheon, and the word was towards God, which really means the word was in relationship with God. It's cross in the relational sense. The word was in relationship with God, eyeball to eyeball, as it were, speaking metaphorically. And the word was God. Now, I know many, 
have sought to escape the, the simplicity of that statement, but to us it's clear. It's saying that, um, that the Word uh, is God, was God, um, and uh, that the Word was somehow in relationship with God, uh, the Word of God, uh, and, and God himself are one and the same, and yet they, uh, God speaks his Word, uh, his Word is his, his word is himself, and yet his word is with him. Um, and then later in that chapter, verse 14, well, sorry, I mean, where it becomes even more uh, clear is uh, uh, in the next verse, uh, this, this word, utos en enarchia proston pion, this word was in the beginning with God. Parte di autu agenito, everything came into existence through him. This word is the creator of all things. As Genesis says, God, in the beginning God said, let there be light, uh, and there was light. Uh, the word was with God in creating the world, but as John makes very clear, the word is not separate from God. The word is God. And then in verse 14, uh, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. Now, I mean, that's just one of many, many examples. It's very, very clear, I think, to, to us who read the scriptures that, uh, that they, uh, their understanding, the understanding of the Christian scriptures is that God became a human being uh, without ceasing to be God, um, that God is, is, well, no, just let me say it like that as simply as that. And therefore, we worship Jesus. We go to the to the end of the book of John, to its climax, uh, chapter 20, where one of the uh, apostles that was not present, uh, the first time when Jesus appeared alive from the dead and spoke to his apostles, one of them wasn't there. When they told him, he refused to believe that it was possible that Jesus could be alive. And uh, then Jesus appeared to him and said, uh, you know, touch my hands and, and uh, put your hand in my side and see that it's me. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And uh, he worships Jesus. Now, no Jew would worship anything, uh, anyone other than someone he believed to be the, the, the Lord God Almighty himself, the creator of the heaven and earth. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Thomas. Um, it's very clear uh, from the gospel from beginning to end that... Uh, gospel writer understands Jesus to be um, God himself. To us that is obviously fundamental and therefore uh, what, what do we say uh, to Muslims at that point except that our beliefs at that point are different. Our beliefs at that point are irreconcilable. There's no way of kind of sort of stretching or pushing Christianity to a point where uh, it, it's, it's going to somehow agree theologically with Islam. I don't think that that means in any way uh, that we can't in some ways coexist, that we can't in some ways uh, you know, have common cause in, in certain areas, that we can't uh, in some ways be friends. I think uh, we can. As you say, we do have a great deal in common. Um, I very much appreciated your um, that you were not kind of anti-bio. I admit I was kind of expecting that. Um, that. That perhaps is one of the suspicions that Christians have of Muslims, and perhaps it's a false suspicion that that they are uh, that you are uh, kind of anti our, our scriptures. And I, I, I enjoyed that um, very much. Um, you raise the question of justification, and perhaps I should say something a little bit about that. You know, if we go back to to God and to Abraham, um, Abraham who we acknowledge as our, uh, as our father uh, in the face and faith, another thing I think that uh, Muslims and Christians have in common, and Jews have in common. Um, but when we look at the story of God and Abraham, we see a God, we see a God who, who wants fellowship with human beings. A God who wants to be known and a God who wants to 
know us in some kind of relationship. As we read the story of Abraham, we see, we see God in relationship with Abraham. And that's something we see uh, right through. We see it with all, we see it with Moses, we see it with, uh, with David, we see it with, uh, with all the prophets. Um, we see this emphasis on a personal relationship, and yet it's a personal relationship which is made difficult, almost impossible, by, by our natural rebellion against God, by our sin. And, uh, and Job gives a perfect expression to that in the words that you quoted. You know, how can a man be right before God? How is it possible? Um, I remember when I first became a Christian, um, you know, I, 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 like you, I, for the first 18 years of my life, or at least for the intellectual part of that 18 years, when I started thinking, uh, for myself, I rejected the idea that Jesus could be God. I, I rejected the idea that people should need to believe in Jesus. I couldn't see why it wasn't possible to believe God without Jesus. I was very anti-Jesus uh, in those days. Um, my idea of God was very much a concept, a concept in my mind. I had no, I had no personal relationship with God, nor did it ever enter into my head that there was such a thing to be had. It was only when, as I experienced it, God came uh, after me that I, that I had to 